Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Bookachino Live for July. We're so happy to have you here. I've got a number of fabulous books to tell you about. I'm going to start out with the books that you loved most last month. And we've got The Lion Women of Tehran, which I just learned is a USA Today bestseller, which is so exciting. I love this book, as everybody knows. And we've been getting fabulous feedback about it from readers who have um, were early readers of it. So just wonderful, wonderful news. All the Colors of the Dark by Christopher Whitaker. Um, Chris Whitaker's book hit number two on the New York Times list for um, combined hardcover and um, ebook. And also it was um, number three in the hardcover. I just finished The Cliffs uh, this weekend and it's terrific. A really, really fabulous read. Set up in Maine, loved it. The Glassmaker, Tracy Chevalier. I have not read that yet. Um, Sandwich by Catherine Newman. I read that over the weekend. You, When you read it, you feel like you're with this family for their week on vacation. Um, then we've got William Ken Kruger's Spirit Crossing. I haven't read it yet. It's on the pile. One of our readers did say that she read an early copy and cried at the end. So there you go. And I'm reading right now, and I'm reading this one slowly because it's a beautiful hardcover. Thus, I don't want to take it in the pool with me. And it's Jackie by John Tripp. And it is beautifully written from Jackie's point of view of what happened to her through the years. Really, really, really fabulous. I have an interview with Marjan Kamali that just went up about Lion, the Lion Women of Tehran. I'm waiting to get an interview with Chris Whitaker and hopefully with Jay Courtney Sullivan and Dawn Tripp. And we'll do something with Kent, like, you know, closer to when it comes out. So that's where we are right now. And go from here. Okay, so then we did this evening summer presentation. And it's interesting to see because that was over a larger period of time than just one month. So these are the books that people wanted to read the most. Once again, The Lion Women of Tehran, then Shelterwood by Lisa Wingate, All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker, Sandwich again, The Glassmaker again, The Days I Loved You Most by Amy Neff, which is a favorite of mine coming on July 30th, and Kate Quinn's The Briar Club. So we like to see like what happens in the two different presentations and what's clearly resonating with you. So away we go. We're going to start with fiction today. Okay, we first have got the, um, I'm just trying to figure, I'm just going to move this a little bit, The Daldergut Dream Department Store by Miley, and it is out this week. This was one of the book reporter, um, book group speed dating events when we did our speed dating event where people talked about, publishers came on and talked about the books that they think book clubs might enjoy. So here, let's go with the Dream Department Store. In a mysterious town hidden in our collective subconscious, there's a department store that sells dreams. Visitors, both human and animal, shuffle in to purchase their later, latest adventure. Each floor specializes in a specific type of dream. Childhood memories, food dreams, ice skating, dreams of stardom. Flying dreams are almost always sold out. Some seek dreams of loved ones who have died. For Penny, a new enthusiastic hire working at Daldergut is the opportunity of a lifetime. As she uncovers the workings of this whimsical world, she bonds with a cast of unfortunate, for unforgettable characters, including Dowergut, the flamboyant and wise owner, Baby Not Brackabai, a famous dream designer, Maxim, a nightmare producer, and the many customers who dream to heal, dream to grow, and dream to flourish. She loves the idea that this is what you could do. Yeah, I might want to fly. Let's see what happens. Next, we've got Long Island Compromise by Taffy Brodesser Ochner. Uh, this is out this week. I am listening to this on audio, and it has got a great voice, tone, and attitude to what's going on. Really looking forward to listening more and picking up the book. I think I'm going to try and do um, both back to back. So it's 1980. A wealthy businessman named Carl Fletcher is kidnapped from his driveway, brutalized, and held for ransom. He's returned to his wife and kids less than a week later, and the family moves on with their wives. But now, nearly 40 years later, it's clear that perhaps nobody got over the kidnapping. Carl has spent the ensuing years secretly seeking closure to the matter of his kidnapping, while his wife, Ruth, has spent her potential protecting her husband's emotional health. Their three grown children aren't doing much better. As they hover at the de delicate precipice of a different kind of survival, they learn that the family fortune has dwindled to just about nothing, and they must face desperate questions about how much their wealth has played a part in both their lives' successes and failures. 
just at the beginning. If anybody wants to listen on audio, voice, tone, great on this. Um, super fun. Next, we've got the Summer Pack by Emily Giffen, which is also out this week. It's interesting. Um, Emily lives down in the Atlanta area, and there's a big race on the 4th of July called the Peachtree Race, and everybody always wants to go be in this race. And she was on the Today Show last week, and she said that she would do it under one condition, that they could get her back in time to do the race the next day. So I thought that was like really fun. And her son won in his um, age group, which was really terrific. So here's what we've got here. Four freshmen live at college from completely different worlds. Lainey, a California party girl with a flair for drama. Tyson, a brilliant scholar and aspiring lawyer from Washington, D.C. Summer, an ambitious recruited athlete from the Midwest. And Hannah, a mild-mannered Southerner. Soon after arriving on campus, they strike up a conversation in their shared dorm. College years fly by. The four are inseparable. As graduation years, their lives are forever changed after a desperate act leads to tragic consequences. They make a pact promising to always be there for one another. So now it's 10 years later and Hannah is anticipating what should be one of the happiest moments of her life when everything is suddenly turned upside down and calling on her closest friends, it soon becomes clear that they're all facing their own crossroads. So there's the Summer Pact, perfect book by the pool book folks. Next, we've got Tell It To Me Singing by Tita Ramirez. It's also out this week. It was also in the book group speed dating program. Monica Campo is pregnant with her first child when moments before being wheeled into emergency heart surgery, her mother confesses a long held secret. Monica's father is not the man who raised her. But when her mother wakes up and begins having delusional episodes, Monica doesn't know what to believe, whether the confession was real or just channeling of a telenova her mother watches nightly. In her despair, Monica wants to speak only with one person, her ex-boyfriend of five years, Manny. She can't help but worry, though, what this says about her relationship with her fiancé and the father of her unborn child. Monica's search for the truth leads her to a new understanding of the past. And it's really funny when they talk about channeling the telenova. We were at my aunt's house when we were little, and they were talking about these people, and they were going on and on and on about everything that was happening with these people. And my mother was, oh, my gosh, I feel so sorry for these people. Is there any way we can help them? And my aunt turns around and she goes, these are on the stories, the soap operas we watch in the afternoon. So when I was reading about this, I was just laughing, picturing that moment, my childhood. Next, we got The Blackbird Oracle by Deborah Harkness on sale on July 16th. She first introduced readers to Diana Bishop, an Oxford scholar and witch, and vampire gen geneticist Matthew de Clermont in A Discovery of Witches. Drawn to each other, despite long-standing taboos, these two otherworldly beings found themselves at the center of a battle for a lost enchanted manuscript known as Ashmole 782. Now in this highly anticipated fifth installment in the All Souls series, Diana and Matthew receive a formal demand from the congregation. They must test the magic of their seven-year-old twins, Pip and Rebecca. Concerned with their safety and desperate to avoid the same fate that led her parents to spellbind her, Diana decides to forge a new path for her family's future and answers a message from a great aunt she never knew existed, whose invitation simply reads, it's time you came home, Diana. So there you go, the Blackbird Oracle. Okay, this is the book I was telling you I love. It was part of book group Speed Dating. It's one of our summer reading giveaway titles. It's a, I'm going to be talking to Amy, doing an interview with her, and it's a book reporter bets on selection. Okay, that's four folks, four things going for this book. Um, what I really am amazed at is Amy, I believe, is in her 30s, and she writes a book about marriage that is absolutely incredible, of the ups and downs and what happens to a long-time marriage. It's out on July 30th. So what we've got is Joseph and Evelyn, their New England beach homes have been side by side for generations. In the summer of 1941, on the shores where they were raised, these two childhood friends fell in love. And now more than 60 years later, with a lifetime between them, they gather their grown children to share the staggering news. Evelyn has received a tragic diagnosis and Joseph feels he can't live without her. So they're telling their children that in one year's time, they're going to end their life on their own terms. Now, while this sounds tragic and horrible and everything, it's really not like the whole thrust of the book. The whole thrust of the book is really about these people and their marriage and their love for their children and just everything that happened to them from each of their perspectives and their perspectives together. 
So as the couple comes to grip with their fates, they retrace their past that brought them to this moment. They embark on a journey to create new memories to cherish, to live out their greatest dreams, and to comfort and connect with each of their children before they're gone. But as their final days draw near, they must confront the stark reality of what they're about to do and make peace with the legacy they will leave behind for their family. And what you really have to see is how they each approach what's happening as time goes on. It's on sale July 30th. Um, she is going to be actually at the Brielle Library in New Jersey that evening, and I'm planning to be there. So if anybody goes to New Jersey, um, we can check that out together. Next from Rainbow Row, we've got Slow Dance coming also on July 30th. Shiloh and Carrie were best friends. They spent the entire summer sitting on Shiloh's porch steps dreaming about the future. They were both going to get out of North Omaha. Shiloh would go to college and become an actress, and Carrie would join the Navy. They promised each other that their friendship would never change. Well, Shiloh did go to college and Carrie did join the Navy, but somehow everything changed. Now Shiloh's 33, and it's been 14 years since she talked to Carrie. She's been married and divorced, she's got two kids, and she's back living in the same house she grew up in. She was invited to an old friend's wedding. All Shiloh can think about is, uh, will Carrie be there? And she hopes he will. Will Carrie ever want to talk to her? After everything, the answer is yes, and yes, and yes. So this sounds like a really fun one for slow dance. Next, we've got Hum, which also was a book group speed dating title. It's coming on August 6th from Helen Phillips. In a city addled by climate change and populated by intelligent robots called Hums, May loses her job to artificial intelligence. In a desperate bid to resolve her family's debt and secure their future, she has, uh, wait a second, future for, um, for another few months. She becomes a guinea pig in an experiment that alters her face so it cannot be recognized by surveillance. Seeking some reprieve from her recent hardships and her family's addiction to their devices, she splurges on passes that allow them a three nights respite inside the botanical garden, a rare green refuge where forest streams and animals flourish. But when the children come under threat, May is forced to put her trust in a hum of uncertain motives as she works to restore the life of her family. So there we've got hum. Mm, I'll do that. <laughs> Next, we're going to do some historical fiction. Starting out with Kate Quinn, which is out this week, The Briar Club. Washington, D.C., 1950. Everyone keeps to themselves at the Briarwood House, a down at the heels, all female boarding house in the heart of the nation's capital, where secrets hide behind white picket fences. But when the lovely, mysterious widow Grace March moves into the attic room, she draws her oddball collection of neighbors into unlikely friendships. Grace's weekly attic room dinner parties and window brewed sun tea become a healing balm on all their lives. But she hides a terrible secret of her own. When a shocking act of violence tears the house apart, the Briar Club women must decide once and for all who is the true enemy in their midst. So there we've got Washington, 1950. Just picture that setting. So we've got in the, the Heart in Winter by Kevin Barry, which is also on sale this week. It's October 1891. A hard winter approaches across the Rocky Mountains. The city of Butte, Montana is rich on copper mines and rampant with vice and debauchery among a hard living crowd of immigrant Irish workers. Here we find Tom Rourke, a young poet and ballad maker of the town, but also a doper, a drinker, and a fearsome degenerate. Polly Gillespie arrives in town as the new bride of an extremely devout mine captain, Long Anthony Harrington. A thunderbolt love affair takes spark between Tom and Polly, and they strike out west on a stolen horse. But a posse of deranged Cornish gunmen are soon in hot pursuit and closing in fast. With everything to lose and the safety and anonymity of San Francisco still a distant speck on their horizon, the choices they make will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Note there's a lot of haunting for the rest of your lives. Tomorrow, today when you get up, you have to sit there and think, what is going to haunt me for the rest of my life? Next, we've got The Bright Sword coming from Lev Grossman on July 16th. A gifted young knight named Colum arrives at Camelot to compete for a spot on the round table, only to find that he's too late. The king died two weeks ago at the Battle of Common, leaving no heir, and only a handful of the knights of the round table survive. They're joined by Nimue, uh, who was Merlin's apprentice until she turned on him and buried him under a hill. 
Together, this ragtag fellowship will set out to be rebuild Camelot in a world that has lost its balance. But Arthur's death has revealed Britain's fault lines. Kingdoms are turning on each other. Warlords lay siege to Camelot, and rival factions are forming around the disgraced Lancelot and the fallen queen Guinevere. It's up to Colum and his companions to reclaim Excalibur, solve the mysteries of this ruined world, and make it whole again. So this is um, the author of the Magician's Trilogy. So then you may recognize his name from that. Next, we've got Knit by M.T. Anderson. M.T. Anderson is probably a name that you remember from YA fiction. This is her, this is the first adult novel from M.T. Anderson. It's coming on July 23rd. The year is 1087 and a pox is sweeping through the Italian city of Barry. When a lonely monk is visited by St. Nicholas in his dreams, he interprets the vision as a call to serve the sick. But his superiors and the power brokers they serve have different plans for the tender-hearted um, brother Nisphorius. Enster Tayum, a charismatic treasure hunter renowned for liberating holy relics from their tombs. 700-year-old bones of St. Nicholas are room to weep, a mysterious liquid that can heal the sick, Tayun says. For the humble price of a small fortune, he will steal the bones and deliver them to Barry, curing the plague and restoring glory to the former city. And Nisphorus, the dreamer, will be his guide. What follows is a heist for the agents as Nisphorus is swept away on strange tides and alongside every stranger bedfellows, alongside even stranger bedfellows to commit sacrilegious acts. So there we've got M.T. Anderson's first adult novel. Next, we've got The Thirteenth Husband by Greer McAllister coming on August 6th. When Amy is 10 years old, as the night dips into the witching hour, the woman in white appears to her. Minutes later, Amy's father is dead and Amy inherits a fortune. But the woman in white never really leaves Amy, appearing as a sinister specter before every tragedy in her life. Despite Amy's wealth, her cross-continental travels and her increasingly shopping, shocking progression of husbands, Amy is haunted by the undefiable woman's mysterious motivations. Tearing through millions of dollars, four continents, and a hearty collection of husbands, real-life heiress Amy Crocker blazed an unbelievable trail of public scandal, private tragedy, and the kind of strong, independent woman that 1980s, the 1880s had never seen. It's pictured 13 husbands. Does that mean 13 uh, weddings? I mean, really, we're talking crazy here, folks. Make sure this is on... Well, not vibrate. Okay. Let's do some thrillers and mysteries. Let's start with Lisa Jewell's Breaking the Dark, a Jessica Jones Marvel crime novel. This is something a little bit different, folks. It's coming from Hyperion Avenue. It's out now. Breaking the Dark is the first book in the brand new Marvel crime series, introducing fans to a grittier street level of the Marvel universe. And it will continue with original novels featuring favorite fan characters by Luke Cage, which is going to be written by S.A. Cosby, and Daredevil, which is going to be written by Alex Segura. Jessica Jones is a retired superhero turned private investigator. One morning, a distraught Amber Randall comes into her office. She's adamant that something happened to her teenage twins while they were visiting their father in the U.K., Twins don't act like themselves, and they now have flawless skin, have lost their distinctive tics and habits, and keep talking about a girl named Belle. Traveling to a small village in the British countryside, Jessica meets the mysterious Belle, who lives curiously isolated in an old farmhouse with a strange woman that claims to be her guardian. Can this unworldly teenager be responsible for the Randall twins' new personas? What does that strange little village of Barton Wallop seem to harbor? dark energies and mysteries in its tight community. So exactly what's going on. Alicia Jewell is going to break the dark. Next, we've got Bad Tourists, which is out just this week from Carol Carver. I love this book. It's set in the Maldive Islands, but I loved it because there was one twist after another. And it's just, I was, I was reading it. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's really good when you've read a number of books and you can still say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, it's one of our summer reading selections. The contest for it is going to be up next Tuesday for anybody who wants to enter to win. It'll be one of our 24-hour contests. I am going to be interviewing Caro next week, and it's book reporter bets on selection. So why do I like this book? Best friends Darcy, Kamala, and Kate escape for a post-divorce retreat to the Maldives. The perfect place to relax, reset, and embrace a fresh start in life. 
Darcy, who initiated this trip and is put in the bill, is learning how to be a free woman at 42. Camilla has found the perfect calling as a fitness and wellness influencer with a devoted following. I do love that she is doing Pilates like, you know, on um, like Instagram so that everyone can be watching her and she's trying to get her friends to do it as well. Very funny. And Kate is finally working on the book that she was meant to write after years of telling other people's stories. She was a ghostwriter for years. So their dream at Getaway is the exclusive and isolated Sapphire Island Resort with luxurious private villas, crystal clear waters, and sun-drenched white sand beaches, relaxing is guaranteed. But this is no ordinary friendship, and they're not the only guests on the island with secrets. Who left the body on the beach, and who's next? And that's exactly the way the book plays out, because you're just trying to figure out who are these people really, and what is going on. And it's very, very twisty and so well done. Next from Daniel Silva, also out this week, we have a death in Cornwall. And yes, we're back with art restorer and legendary spy Gabriel, Gabriel alone, who has slipped quietly into London to attend a reception, at the Courthold Gallery, celebrating the return of a stolen self-portrait by Vincent Van Gogh. What an old friend from the Devon and Cornwall police seeks his help with a baffling murder investigation, he finds himself pursuing a powerful and dangerous new adversary. The victim is Charlotte Blake a celebrated professor of art history from Oxford, who spends her weekends in the same seaside village where Gabriel once lived under an assumed identity. Her murder appears to be the work of a diabolical serial killer who has been terrorizing the Cornish countryside. But there are a number of telltale inconsistencies, including a missing mobile phone, and then the mysterious three-letter cipher she left behind on a notepad in her study. So there we've got a death in Cornwall. Next, we've got, ah, I Was a Teenage Slasher by Stephen Graham Jones, also coming on July 16th. It's 1989, Lamisa, Texas, small West Texas town driven by oil and cotton and a place where everyone knows everyone's business. So it goes for 17-year-old Tolly Driver, a good kid with more potential than application, who's about to be cursed to kill for revenge. Here, Stephen Graham Jones explores the Texas he grew up in, the unfairness of being on the outside, those slasher horror he lives, but from the perspective of the killer. I'm sorry, through the slasher horror uh, that he lives, uh, but from the perspective of the killer, Tolly writing his own autobiography. You're going to find yourself rooting for a killer in this summer teen movie of a novel gone full blood curling tragic. So there we go. I was a teenage slasher. Perfect cover that. Now we've got One Big Happy Family from Jamie Day. Got this on my shelf. Can't wait to read it. It's the author of The Block Party, which was one of my bets on selections last year. It's coming on July 16th. Here's what we've got. Precipice is a legendary family-owned hotel on the rocky coast of Maine. With the recent passing of their father, the Bishop sisters, Iris, Vicky, and Faith, have come for the weekend to claim it. But with the hurricane looming and each of the Bishop sisters harboring dangerous secrets, there's murder in the air. And not everyone who checks into the precipice will check out. Each sister wants what's rightfully hers. And in the mix is the precipice's 19-year-old chambermaid, Charlie Kelly, who is smart, resilient, older than her years, and in desperate straits. The arrival of the Bishop sisters could spell disaster for Charlie. Will they close the hotel, fire her, discover a habit of fil pilfering from guests, or even worse, warn that she's using a guest room to hide a woman on the run. So they're one big happy family, dot, 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 except they're not. So there you go. Next, we've got Like Mother, Like Daughter by Kimberly Crate. This is one of our spring preview giveaways. Um, they wanted to get the book out to people early. And it was also part of the book group speed dating event. So when Cleo, a student at NYU, arrives right for dinner, late for dinner at her childhood home in Brooklyn, she finds food burning in the oven and no sign of her mother, Kat. And then Cleo discovers her mother's bloody shoe under the sofa. Something terrible has happened, but what? Turns out the cat has been lying. She's not just a lawyer, she's the firm's fixer. In the days leading up to her disappearance, Kat has become aware of multiple threats, demands for money from her unfaithful soon-to-be ex-husband, evidence that Cleo has slipped back into a relationship that's far riskier than she understands, and menacing anonymous messages from her past, all of which she has kept hidden from Cleo. So there we've got like mother, like daughter. Kimberly McCrate is the um, author of the very uh, much acclaimed Reconstructing Amelia. So you know she's got chops to be doing this again. 
Next, we've got Look in the Mirror from Katherine Stedman. It's coming on July 30th. Still grieving from the loss of her father, Nina finds that she has her inherited property in the British Virgin Islands, a vacation home she has no idea has existed until now. I would like that to happen to me. I'm just saying that. Not going to happen, but I would love it. House is extraordinary, state-of-the-art, all glass and marble. How did her sensible father come into enough money for this? Why did he keep it from her? And what else is he hiding? Maria, once an ambitious medical student, is a nanny for the super rich. Just one more gig and she'll be all set. Finally, she'll be secure. But when her wards never show, Maria begins to raise, make herself at home, spending her days luxuriating by the pool and in the sauna. But there's just one rule. Don't go in the basement. That room is off limits, but her curiosity just might get the best of her. And soon she'll wish her only worry was not getting paid. Next, okay, we've got my one sit read. I've got a long time in the pool to be reading this one. It's Sherry LaPena's What Have You Done? And it's coming on July 30th. And I just love her books every single time. But once I start, I don't stop. Nothing ever happens in the sleepy little Fairhill, Vermont. Mm -mm, nothing happens. But this morning, that's going to change. And one innocent question could be deadly. What have you done? Teenagers get their kicks telling ghost stories in the old graveyard. The parents trust that their kids will arrive home safe from school. But Diana Brewer isn't lying safely in her bed where she belongs. Says she lies in a hayfield, circled by vultures, discovered by a local farmer. How quickly a girl becomes a ghost. Quickly a town of fam friendly, familiar faces becomes a town of suspects, a place of fear and paranoia. Someone in Fairhill did this, and everyone wants answers. So there we've got, what have you done? I'm Sherry LaPena. Next, we've got Archangel from James Rollins, which is coming on August 6th. The execution of the Vatican archivist within the shadows of the Kremlin exposes a conspiracy going back three centuries to the bloody era of the Russian czars. Before his murder, he manages to dispatch a coded message, a warning of terrifying threat, one tied to a secret buried within a golden library of czars, a vast and treasured archive that has vanished into history. As combative forces race for the truth behind this death and alarming discovery, Sigma Force is summoned to aid in the search, not only for the missing trove of ancient books, but to follow a trail far into the Arctic to search for the truth about a lost continent and a revelation that could ignite a global war. But Sigma Force has its own difficulties at home after an explosive attack on the National Mall one aimed for the heart, at the heart of their covert agency that has left them vulnerable and exposed. So there's one of James Rowland's latest Sigma Force novels. Then from Kathy Reichs, we've got Fire and Bones, her latest Temperance Bremoth novel. Always apprehensive about working fire scenes, forensic anthropologist Temperance Brenner is called to Washington, D.C. to analyze the victims of a deadly blaze, blaze I'm sorry, and sees her misgivings justified. The devastated building is in Foggy Bottom, a neighborhood with a colorful past and present. Tempe becomes suspicious about the property's ownership as she delves into the history. Pieces start falling into place strangely and quickly, and sensing a good story, Tempe kneels with a, um, teams with a new ally, telejournalist Ivy Doyle. Soon the duo learn that back in the 30s and 40s, the home was the hangout of a group of bootleggers and racketeers, racketeers known as the Foggy Bottom Gang. This is interesting, that seems kind of irrelevant, until the son of a pop fo Foggy Bottom Gang member is shot dead in his home in an affluent part of the district. Coincidence? Targeted attack? So many questions. Kathy's going to answer them for us in Fire and Bones. Next, we've got House of Glass by Sarah Pekinen. This is coming on August 6th. It's going to be one of our summer reading giveaways. Contest is going to be on the 6th, so just make a note of that, folks. Rose Barkley is a nine-year-old girl who witnessed the possible murder of her nanny in the midst of her parents' bitter divorce and immediately stopped speaking. Stella Hudson is a best interest attorney appointed to serve as counsel for children in custody cases. From the moment Stella passes through the iron security gate and steps up to the gilded, historic D.C. home of the Barclays, she realizes the case is even more twisted and the Barclay family far more troubled than she feared. And there's something eerie about the house itself. It's a plastic house mm, with not a single bit of glass to be found. Like, What's that all about? 
And Stella comes closer to uncovering the secrets the Barclays are desperate to hide. Danger wraps around her like a shroud, and her past and present are set on a collision course in ways she never expected. I will want to talk to Sarah, and I will want to know what made you think about a house that is constructed of plastic. Got to know this answer. And we're going to do some memoirs, biographies, and some other nonfiction. First up, two people I never would have put together. Tiger, Tiger by James Patterson. Yes, this is Tiger Woods, his life as it's never been told before in James Patterson's hands, coming on July 15th. The first full-scale Tiger Woods biography of the decade. On April 13th, 1986, 10-year-old Tiger Wood watches his idol, Jack Nicklaus, win his record sixth Masters. Just over a decade later, Tan's chance of Tiger, Tiger, ring out. The 21-year-old wins his first screen jacket. He blazes on an incredible path, winning 14 major titles, second only to Nicholas himself, by the time he's 33, smashing records and raising standards. And then come multiple public scandals and potential career-ending injuries. The once-assured champion becomes an all-American underdog. YouTube golfer is now how his two children know their father, winless since 2013, until he wins the 2019 Masters, his 15th major before their eyes. But the story doesn't end there. In our house, there's a lot of golf going on. My husband plays a lot of golf. We watch a lot of golf. I feel like Tiger's son lives at our house. Like, I feel like we should come over. We should invite them over at some point. His son's a terrific golfer as well. So Tiger, Tiger, anybody in your family that loves golf, here you go. My Father's Day present. That came out too late. Okay, next we've got The Genius of Judy. How Judy Bloom rewrote childhood for all of us by Raquel Bergstein. It's coming on July 16th. Judy Bloom's books have garnered her fans of all ages for decades and sold tens of millions of copies. But why were so people so drawn to them? And why are we still talking about them now in the 21st century? In The Genius of Judy, Bloom's remarkable story is revealed as never before, beginning with her mother, her as a mother of two, searching for purpose outside her home in 1960s suburban New Jersey. The books she wrote starred regular children with genuine thoughts and problems. But behind those deceptively simple tales, she explored the pillars of growing women's rights movement, in which girls and women were entitled to careers, bodily autonomy, fulfilling relationship, and even sexual pleasure. She wasn't trying to be revolutionary. She just wanted to tell honest stories. But in doing so, she created a cohesive, culture-altering alter, alter, okay, culture vision of modern adolescence. So there we've got the genius of Judy Bloom. Definitely for lots of Judy Bloom fans. Next, we've got JFK Jr. It's coming from Rosemary Terenzio and Liz McNeil. It's a pleasure um, meeting both of them at a lunch that was uh, done pre-pub. It's coming on July 16th. It's the first oral biography of JFK Jr.'s extraordinary, intimate, comprehensive look at the real man behind the myth. Sharing never-be-told stories and insights, his closest friends, confidants, lovers, classmates, teachers, and colleagues paint a vivid portrait of one of the most beloved figures of the 20th century, revealing how the boy who saluted became the man came to know and love and still captures the public's imagination 25 years after his tragic death. JFK Jr. dives deep into his complicated psyche and explores the what-ifs, illuminating the both cultural and political moment he inhabited and the way that the son of a president so full of promise and possibility embodied America's most cherished hopes. I just love the idea of the way they put together this book because Rosemary was talking about it's really these things that you didn't know before. It's people that actually knew somebody as a person, not just a name in a tabloid or a name on a, in, in a, um, a book someplace. And he has so many things that are like so they're so funny about him i remember I, I don't know if this is in the book his um roommates knew that his mother was coming over to visit and he's leaving to go out the door and he goes oh my mom's coming let me describe her she's about this tall she's got brown hair and they look and they go we know who your mother is so comes into the um their mother comes into the apartment and she's looking to use the phone and they all look like they haven't seen the phone in days right they don't know where the phone is and she gets on her hands and knees and starts crawling, pulling the phone line. And the guys are just standing there going, oh, my God, like, what did we just do? This is Jackie Kennedy Onassis, like, crawling on our floor. I don't know if that's going to make it into the book, but it was just, like, what was going on, you know, with him, by the way he was. 
And I remember running into some on the street one day and, you know, like, hi, John. And he's like, hey, back getting on his bicycle. It's really, really sad. It's also 25 years later, which is kind of unbelievable. Next, we've got The Bookshop by Evan Friss. It's a history of the American bookstore. It's on sale on August 6th. Bookstores have always been unlike any other kind of store, shaping readers and writers and influencing our tastes, thoughts, and politics. They nurture local communities while creating new ones of their own. They're powerful spaces, but they're also endangered ones. And in the bookshop, we see the stakes, what has been and what might be lost. Evan Friss's history of the bookshop draws on oral histories, archival collections, municipal records, diaries, letters, and interviews with the leading booksellers to offer a fascinating look at this institution beloved by so many. And I would love to see just this, just to see the um, booksellers that I know and their comments about what the bookshop means. Next, we've got Group Living by Lola Milholland. It's coming on August 6th. Ola Mulholland grew up in the 90s, the child of icon, iconoclastic, I, okay, let me try this one again, iconoclastic hippies. I know that's probably wrong. Both her parents threw open their rambling house in Portland, Oregon to longtime visitors and unusual guests in need of a place to stay. Years later, after college and her parents' separation, Mulholland returned home, and there she joined her brothers and housemates, an eccentric group of stop-motion animators and accomplished cooks, and fervoring the experiment of communal living into a new generation. Group Living and Other Recipes tells the story of the residents of the Holman House, of trans trans oh, let's try this again, transcendent meals and ecstatic parties, of colorful characters coming together in moments of deep tenderness and inevitable, ir inevitable irritation, a shared life that is appealing, humorous, confounding, and just maybe utopian, with a wider exploration of group living as a way of life. There's group living and other... And then Ruth Ozeki said, reading this book is like finding a friend. I love that. Okay, this is a book I really do want to read. It's on my floor in the other room. It's called Wanted, Toddler's Personal Assistant by Tef Stephanie Kaiser. It was one of the book group's speed dating titles. When Stephanie Kaiser moved to New York after college to pursue a career in writing. She quickly learns that her entry level salary will not cover the high cost of living, never mind her crushing student loan debt. But there's one in demand job that, job that pays more than enough to allow her to stay in the city, nannying for the 1%. Desperate to escape the poverty of her own childhood and jump social classes, Stephanie falls into a job that hijacks her life for the next seven years as a personal assistant to toddlers. Yes, you read that right, folks. On Manhattan's Upper East Side. And what she, the, the subtitle of this book is How Nannying for the 1% Taught Me About the Myths of Equality, Motherhood, and Upward Mobility in America. Looking forward to it. Come some September titles to look forward to, and it's going to be a big month. Starting out with Creation Lake by Rachel Kushner. Um, she was a two-time National Book Award finalist. This is coming on September 3rd. It's about a secret agent, a 34-year-old American woman of ruthless tactics, bold opinions, and clean beauty who is sent to do dirty work in France. Sadie Smith is how the narrator introduces herself to her lover, lover to the rural commune of French subversives on whom she's keeping tabs and to the reader. Sadie's left met her love, Lucien, a young and well-born Parisian, by cold bump, making him believe the encounter was accidental. Like everyone Sadie targets, Lucien is useful to her and is used by her. She operates by strategy and dissimulation based on what her contacts, shadowy figures in business and government, instruct. In this region of centuries-old farms and ancient caves, Sadie becomes entranced by a mysterious figure named Bruno Lacombe, a mentor to the local activists who communicates only by email. Bruno believes that the path to emancipation from what ails modern life is not revolt, but a return to the ancient past. Well, there you go, creation lake. Next, we've got Death at the Sign of a Rook by Kate Atkinson, also coming on September 3rd. It's the sixth installment in her Jackson Brody series, paying homage to the masters of the mystery genre, from Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers to the modern era of Knives Out and Only Murders in the Building. In the sleepy Yorkshire town, ex-detective Jackson Brody is staving off boredom and malaise. His only case is the seemingly tedious matter of a stolen painting. But Jackson soon discovers a string of unsolved art thefts that lead him down a dizzying spiral of disguise and deceit 
to Burton Makes Make Peace, a formerly magnificent estate now partially converted into a hotel hosting mystery murder mystery weekends. So there you go. It'd be fun, a murder mystery weekend. But of course, if it's a book, someone's going to die. So there you go. Next, we've got The Haunting of Moscow House by Alicia um, Sal 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 Okay, let me do this again. Alicia Salonikova Gilmore, and it's coming on September 3rd. Okay, it's the summer of 1921, and a group of Bolsheviks has taken over Irena and Lily Goltaviva's ancestral house in Moscow. The remaining members of their family are ordered to move in the cramped attic, while officials take up an entire wing of grand rooms downstairs. The sisters know they must forget their noble upbringing to make their way in this new Soviet Russia. The past begins to whisper of a traumatic past, not as dead as they thought. Eager to escape it and their unwelcome new landlords, they find jobs with the recently arrived American Relief Organ Administration. But at home, the spirits of their deceased family awaken, desperate to impart what really happened to them during the revolution. And soon, one of the officials living in the house is found dead. Was the death caused by something supernatural or by someone all too human? And our Irena, Lily, and their family next. So there you've got the haunting of Moscow House. And uh, Chanel Clayton, who's the New York Times bestselling author, said this is both as atmospheric and gripping. And I definitely get that from the cover. Next, we've got The Life Impossible by Matt Haig. And yes, you know his name because he's the bestselling author of The Midnight Library. It's coming on September 3rd. Retired math teacher Grace Winters has left a rundown house on a Mediterranean island by a long lost friend. Curiosity gets the best of her. She arrives in Ibiza with a one way ticket, no guidebook, and no plan. Among the rugged hills and golden beaches of the island, Grace searches for answers about her friend's life and how it ended. What she uncovers is a stranger than she ever could have dreamed. But to dive into this impossible truth, she first has to come to terms with her past. So there we've got the life impossible. Now, from Lee Child, we've got Safe Enough coming from Mysterious Press, which is not his typical publisher, which is Bantam Valentine. And this is coming on, on September 3rd from Mysterious Press. And for the last 20 years, Lee Child's been one of the best-selling authors in the world, thanks to the popularity of his iconic and really recognizable um, hero, Jack Reacher. But even at the height of Reacher's fame, uh, Child's short story writing was not confined to the series. Throughout the course of his career, he published tales about a range of characters on both sides of the law, including assassins, a bodyguard, CIA and FBI agents, gangsters, and more. Meticulously plotted and packed with tr Child's trademark action and suspense, the stories show his mastery of the short form. They've never been collected before. So it's really fun, safe enough, and other stories. Then we've got Bone of the Bone, Essays on America by a Daughter of the Working Class by Sarah Smarsh. And I'm looking forward to this one because I really loved her um, book, Heartland, which was a National Book Award finalist. She did a brilliant job on that. This is coming out on September 10th. And Bone of the Bone, National Book Award finalist Sarah Smarsh brings her graceful storytelling and incisive critique to the challenges that define our times. Class division, political fissures, gender equality, environmental crisis, media bias, and the rural urban gulf. Smarsh, a journalist who grew up on a wheat farm in Kansas and was the first of her family to graduate from college, has long focused on the cultural dissonance that many of her industry neglected until recently. Now, this thought-provoking collection of more than 30 of her highly relevant pre previously published essays from the past decade demonstrate a life and career steeped in the issues that affect our collective future. So I think this is going to be very interesting because she looks at the big picture instead of just like who I am and what I'm doing. Next, from Leanne Moriarty, and yes, we all do know who Leanne Moriarty is, we've got Here One Moment coming on September 10th. Aside from a delay, there will be no problems. The flight will be smooth, it will land safely. Everyone who gets on the plane will get off, but almost all of them will be forever changed because this ordinary short domestic flight, something extraordinary happens. People learn how and when they're going to die. For some, their death is far in the future, age 103, and they laugh. But for six passengers, their predicted deaths are not far away at all. If you were told you had only a certain amount of time to live, would you do things differently? Would you try to dodge your destiny? 
I don't know. I'm heading out to Colorado soon. I hope the flight's going to be smooth and none of this is going to happen. Next, we've got the siege, which is coming from Ben McIntyre. Six-day hostage crisis and the daring special forces operation that shocked the world. It's coming on September 10th. It's the American hostage crisis in Iran boiled into its seventh month in the spring of 1980. Six heavily armed guardmen a gunman flanged into the barge into the Iranian embassy in London, taking 26 hostages. What well, followed over the next six days was an increasingly tense standoff, one that threatened at any moment to spill into a bloodbath. Story of ordinary and men and women under immense pressure, the siege takes readers minute by minute, thrilling through the episode, uh, through the event that would echo across the next two decades and provide a direct historical link to the tragedy on 9 11. Drawing on exclusive interviews and a wealth of never before seen files, Ben McIntyre reconstructs a week in which every day minted a new hero and every second spelled the potential for doom. So there's something interesting about something that I'm sure most of us have forgotten about. Next, we've got Tell Me Everything by Elizabeth Strout coming on September 10th. Beautiful cover. So let's go with this. It's autumn in Maine. Back in Maine, folks, the town lawyer Bob Burgess has become enmeshed in an unfolding murder investigation, defending a lonely, isolated man accused of killing his mother. He's also fallen into a deep and abiding friendship with the acclaimed writer, Lucy Barton, who lives down the road in a house by the sea with her ex-husband, William. Together, Lucy and Bob go on walks, talk about their lives, their fears, their regrets, and what might have been. Lucy, meanwhile, is finally introduced to the iconic Olive Kitteridge. Wow, this is a lot of books coming together, folks, now living in a retirement community on the edge of town. It's been afternoons together in Olive's apartment, telling each other stories. Stories about people they've known, unrecorded lives, Olive calls them, reanimating them and in the process, viewing their lives with meaning. Sounds like a lot of fun. Tell me everything. Next from Ruman Alam, we have Entitlement coming on September 17th. Brooke wants, she isn't in need, but there are things she wants. Sense of purpose, for instance. She wants to make a difference in the world, to press her mother along the way, spend time with friends and secure her independence. Her job assisting an octogenarian billionaire in his quest to give away a vast fortune can help her achieve many of those goals and may inspire new desires as well. Proximity to wealth, it turns out to be nothing less than transformative. What is mon money really? But a kind of belief. So there we've got entitlement. And what does that really mean? Next, we've got a highly anticipated book. It's The Night We Lost Him by Laura Dave. You know her as the author of The Last Thing He Told Me, which was also a terrific show on Apple. It's um, a, one of the book group speed dating titles that was presented. It's on sale September 17th. Liam Noom is on many things to many people. To the public, he was exacting self-made hotel magnet fleeing his past to his three ex-wives. He was loving, albeit distant family man who kept his finances flush and his families carefully separated. To Nora, he was the father who often loved her from afar, notably a cliffside cottage po perched on the California coast from which he fell to his death. The authorities rule the death accidental, but Nora and her strange mother, Sam, have other ideas. As Nora and Sam form an uneasy alliance to unravel the mystery, they start putting together pieces of their father's past and uncover a family secret that changes everything. So there's the night we lost him, which is different from the last thing he told me, which is also she's writing a follow-up to. So there you go, the complete world of Laura Dave right now. Next, we've got We Solve Mysteries by uh, Richard Osman, which is the New York Times bestselling author of The Thursday Murder Club. It's coming on September 17th. Steve Wheeler is joy enjoying retired life. He still does the odd bit of investigating, but he prefers his family, his familiar routines. The pub quiz, his favorite bench, a cat waiting for him at home. His days of adventure are over. Adrenaline is his daughter-in-law's Amy's job now. Amy Wheeler thinks adrenaline is good for the soul. Working in private security every day is dangerous. And she's currently on a remote island protecting mega best-selling author Rosie D'Antonio until a dead body and a bag of money means trouble in paradise. So she sends an SOS to the only person she trusts. As a thrilling race around the world begins, can Amy and Steve outrun and outsmart a killer? 
So there we've got, we solve murders. Imagine if you were that person, just say, dad, come on, come down and help me. Next from Nicholas Sparks, we've got Counting Miracles coming on September 24th. Tanner Hughes was raised by his grandparents, following in his grandfather's military foot, footsteps to become an army ranger. When his grandmother passes away, her last words to him are, find where you belong. She also drops a bombshell, telling him the name of the father he never knew and where to find him. Tanner sets out for Asheboro, North Carolina to ask around. Been in the town less than 24 hours when he meets Caitlin Cooper, a doctor and single mom. And they both feel an immediate connection. Meanwhile, nearby, 83-year-old Jasper lives alone in a cabin, haunted by a tragic accident that took place decades before. When he hears rumors that a white deer has been spotted in the forest, a creature of legend that inspired his father and grandfather, he becomes obsessed with protecting the deer from poachers. These characters or fates orbit closer together. None of them is expecting a miracle, but that would, may be about exactly what is going to alter their futures forever. So there we've got Counting Miracles. Next from Sally Rooney, we've got Intermezzo. And you know her as the author of Beautiful World, Where Are You? It's coming on September 24th. Aside from the fact that they are brothers, Peter and Ivan Kubek have little in common. Peter is a Dublin lawyer in his 30s. In the wake of their father's death, he's medicating himself to sleep and struggling to manage his relationships with two very different women, his enduring first love, Sylvia, and Naomi, a college student for whom life is one long joke. Ivan is a 22-year-old competitive chess player. In the early weeks of his bereavement, he meets Margaret, an older woman, emerging from her own turbulent past, and their lives become rapidly and intensely inter intertwined. For two grieving brothers and the people they love, this is a new interlude, a period of desire, despair, and possibility, a chance to find out how much one life might hold itself without breaking. So there we've got intermezzo. Then from Richard Powers, you know him as the uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize and the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Overstory, we have Playground. This was also in the book group Speed Dating Program. It's on sale on September 24th. 12 year old Evie Ballou sinks to the bottom of a swimming pool in Montreal, strapped to one of the world's first aqua lungs. Ina Ariata grows up on a naval bases across the Pacific with art as her only home. Two polar opposites at an elite Chicago high school bond over a 3,000-year-old board game. Rafi Young will get lost in literature, while Todd Keene's work will lead to a startling AI breakthrough. They meet on the history-scarred island of Maktia in French Polynesia, whose deposits of phosphorus once helped to feed the world. Now, the tiny atoll has been I'm sorry, the tiny atoll has been chosen for humanity's next adventure, a plan to send floating autonomous cities into the open sea. But first, the island's residents must vote to greenlight the project or turn the seasteaders away. So there we have Playground. Sounds fabulous and the cover looks terrific. Okay, so these are some notable July paperbacks that are coming out. Got All the Sinners Bleed by S.A. Cosby. I've got this book on my pile since last year. I really want to read it. So he's won all kinds of awards. He's a terrific person. Just, you know, would love to get more into what his work is. We've got The Brightest Star by Gail Sugiyama. We've got The Burnout by Sophie Kinsella. We've got The Connollys of County Down by Tracy Lang. And I interviewed her, and this was a bet sign, as was Evergreen by uh, Naomi Hirahara. Prom Mom by Laura Littman. John Grisham's The Exchange. Day, a novel. Jackie, and I can't see, I'm sorry, I can't see who the author is. The Spectacular by Fiona Davis, which has a very different cover than the original book, the original hardcover. Cutting Teeth by Chandler Baker. Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. And that was also a Bets on selection. So there you've got July paperbacks, perfect to take to the beach, the lake, or your backyard, wherever you're going. So far this year, I have made, picked 16 bets on selections. I have a lot coming in the next couple of weeks. I've hit on some books that I really think you're going to love. And so I've been playing around with a copy for those. Two will be going up this week. So very excited about a lot of books coming up. 
Recent book reporter talk to interviews, Marjan Kamali, the Lion Women of Tehran. Highly recommend listening to our conversation. We had a great time, as I did with Lisa Wingate talking about Shelterwood, Ruth Reichel about the Paris novel, and Genevieve Kingston with Did I Ever Tell You. My book group is going to be reading um, Genevieve's book. Um, it's a memoir. It's a memoir about her mom passing away and leaving her gifts for, you know, through her 30th birthday. And some of them were finding it really difficult to get through this book. And then as they started reading it, they realized how beautiful the story was. And one of them wrote me this morning and said, this is a story that's going to stay with me for a very long time. So there's a, you know, a beautiful memoir that you might have skipped, might have missed. I know a lot of you have read the Paris novel. A lot of you are looking for the Lion Women. And Shelterwood was terrific. And it's also Ken Kruger gave it a big rave last week or two weeks ago when we spoke with him. This is summer reading. These are the titles we're giving away. So we still have a couple of weeks left. I think it's like four or five, four weeks left. So make sure you um, look for these. These Most of them are going up on Tuesdays. So take a look for these books coming out uh, through the beginning of August, middle of August. And our next Bookachino Live event, preview event, will be on uh, August 14th. We we'll preview of books coming from August 13th through September 3rd and a look ahead at October. And sign up is available on Book Reporter and Rating Group Guides. And anybody who signed up today, you will get an invitation to be a part of it. So here's to some really terrific reading. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing everybody next month on Bookachino Live. Thank you.